One of the craziest stories that I ever heard from an inmate was from this ex-drug trafficker, this old guy. This was at Two Rivers Correctional Facility. It's right before I got classed down to minimum, I think in about early 2012. It's after the riot happened and Jimmy got taken to death row, awaiting you know his trial. And they moved in a guy, this old like, like ex-hippie, he had a long, gray ponytail you know you could tell this dude used to be like a surfer bro kind of guy and but he had been locked up for like 25 years already they had shipped him from federal prison and they'd moved him to the state prison i guess just to make bed space or whatever sometimes they would do that they would you know shuffle people around from the feds but he was getting ready to come home and he had been locked up since like 1982 and i verified all this because he had his paperwork you know Inmates, even the inmates that are doing life and that have been locked up for decades, still have the paperwork, their original uh, discovery from court even back in the day. So I'm looking at papers from the 80s that are typed out on like a typewriter. It's, it was fucking weird. And at first this guy didn't offer up a lot of information and that's how I could tell he was legit because real criminals, real thorough dudes usually keep their crimes you know, close to the chest until they trust a person. But we were locked up for like 60 days straight. Somebody had just gotten stabbed. So they were investigating it and we were just selled in. And when you're locked up 24 hours a day with just one other person, trust me, everything starts spilling pretty quickly because there's nothing else to do but just tell your story. And little by little, I find out, okay, this dude used to be a fucking whale. I mean, this guy was moving real large scale coke back in the 70s and 80s. And he'd been caught with over 200 kilos red-handed in Miami back in the late 70s. And I said, wow, that is fucking crazy. I was immediately like enamored by his story because you never meet guys like this, especially not in state prison. So I just picked his brain for hours and hours. And I basically said, you know, this is my story. How did you get caught? He told me back in the day, he was in the boat business. So he owned a bunch of warehouse space in the Miami Harbor where he repaired speedboats and go fast boats. And of course, back in the day, who were the people buying go fast boats, those cigarette speedboats? They were drug traffickers. And that's probably how he fell into the business himself as he got connected through all of these guys that he was repairing boats for. And he told me that his supplier was Rafa Salazar, the guy featured in the Cocaine Cowboys movie. He was basically the lieutenant of the Medellin cartel in Miami at the time. So he dealt with that guy, Max Mermelstein, that whole crew, uh, and he was picking up from those guys. They were the source, they were the connect. So this guy was plugged in and he's slick. He's moving weight. He said he went for about five years, uh, moving 300 keys a month, he said. So this dude was rich. He had owned property even to that day in prison. So I knew he was, I knew he was a man of means. I could tell someone someone's bullshitting. I believe this guy's story. And he was even tied into that criminal enterprise with them too. So it's about 1981 and he meets a woman in a bar and you know, she was beautiful. She was Latin. So he's chatting her up. They begin dating. Six months later, she moves in with them. And you know, everything's going well. He lets her know, this is the business I'm in. I am in the boat business and I make money renting out my dock space, right? He, he was thorough. He didn't just spill all the information at once. A few months later, his girlfriend tells him, hey, I'm pregnant. Now he's in love with her. It's a little soon, but he says, fuck it. I'm gonna marry this broad. But before they tied the knot, he wanted to, you know, tell her the truth. He thought, wow, this is the person I love more than anybody in the world. Uh, I can trust her like I can trust no one else. So I deserve, she deserves to know what I do for a living. So he brought her to his warehouses and was like, he showed her the stuff. He was like, look, I don't want you involved in the business, but God forbid something happens and you need to access money, drugs in order to, you know, pay these dangerous, crazy Colombians that I'm working for. You know, here it is. And he said she took it relatively well. She was a little surprised, but you know, gotta remember this is Miami back in the eighties. So it's like every third person was handling this much weight. It was normal back then. But a couple of days later, she goes missing. 
and he's freaking out. He's calling everybody. He's calling up his Colombian connects. He's calling up his friends. Have you seen her? Have you seen her? He doesn't know where his chick is. This is before cell phones. He's freaking out. He even calls the cops. And, you know, at the same time, he's got this load of cocaine waiting to be moved that he's storing in one of his warehouse spaces. He shows up early morning to the warehouse. He gets raided by the DEA. And guess who's leading that raid? Badge out, hat on, M15 to his face. His girlfriend, his pregnant soon-to-be wife. It gets that deep. They set this whole thing up. They planted her in that bar that day. You know, this piece of ass that got recruited by the DEA, probably for reasons like this, set this motherfucker up, lied, said she was pregnant, and he pulled the classic mistake he showed the broad where the work was at and everything came tumbling down. That was that was the most chilling thing I ever heard. I mean, my nipples are hard right now. I got fucking goosebumps every time I think about that story. And he got 30 years in prison. He was charged, uh, you know, with racketeering and and, you know, heavy drug trafficking. And she was there at his sentencing. She showed up and testified against him. And I mean, not for nothing. I mean, talk about commitment to your job, you know? Like she was fucking this dude for almost a year. So hats off to her for uh, doing her job well, but uh, it cost that guy his life, you know? Hey guys, if you liked that video, make sure to check out the full episode right here and subscribe to the channel right here.